Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thanks so much for coming tonight. Welcome to the 10th episode of the DC Master Gardener Fall 2021 Continuing Education Series. We're here today with Abra Lee. Abra, thank you so much for coming tonight. We're so happy to have you here. Abra has a great presentation for us tonight, so I won't keep you any longer. I'll turn it over to Abra and you go. All right. Thank you all so much for joining me this evening. I'm going to um, go on and share my screen. And just give me one second while we turn that over. Okay, and can can y'all see me? Can is Patricia nod or give me a thumbs up? If can you see my screen rather? Okay, awesome, excellent. All right. Well, tonight, tonight we are going to talk about some legendary people. You're probably gonna hear me say that word 50, 11 times. And that is because real legends will pop off tonight. Some you may know, some you may not know. And regardless, we are going to continue to speak their names and uplift them because they have contributed in exceptional ways to the canon of gardening and horticulture in the United States. So with that, I will state my intention tonight. I hope that you feel uplifted, inspired, empowered. I hope you feel joy at the end of this presentation and you are even more proud of your work as a master gardener as you get to see the women who laid the groundwork before you. All right, so the 1920s. In the 1920s, there were a lot of garden clubs popping off in America, and this included Black women. And this was in places such as North Carolina, down in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, they had them. They had them in Virginia. So the garden clubs started off in this era, but I would say really started to peak and gain notoriety about a decade later. And the reason I wanna bring up the 20s is because prior to this, we are very, very well aware of the history of the United States and we have slavery and then we have the reconstruction era. And during that era is when black people start having uh, the time to have this leisure time to create their own garden. So. I would even dare say that we, uh, uh, look, let me just be very clear. We've been gardening since 1619 when we arrived in America uh, through the Middle Passage, um, through the Atlantic slave trade. However, it was later, later when we were doing our leisure garden time. And so I just want to be clear that we have been a part of this um, whole scenario, the movement for a very, very, very long time. Now, the part about the 1920s that precedes that and how we even get into the era of garden clubs, I have to acknowledge the work of a few people. And one of these people is this gentleman that you see here, Booker T. Washington, an incredibly recognizable face, probably the most famous man in America in his lifetime, and also the most controversial man as well in his lifetime. And regardless of how you feel about Booker T. Washington, we have to be very clear that this is the wizard of Tuskegee. This is the man who built the house that George Washington Carver uh, pretty much just reinvigorates and reinvents the way that we look at horticulture in America. This is the man that brings in David August Williston, the first Black landscape architect. This is the man that brings in men and women, top tier people from all over America to build this new school in Alabama. Now, Booker T. Washington is very key to these garden clubs. And the reason I mention him today is because he is a graduate of Hampton University. He's a star student up there, a star orator, and he is handpicked to start this school at Tuskegee. And Washington credits nature, plants, gardening with his success. He very well documents it in his biography, Up From Slavery, and also in the follow-up to that a biography, which is called Working With The Hands. Now, Booker T. Washington is married three times, and this is a picture of his third wife. Her name is Margaret Murray Washington. And Mrs. Washington is uh, very well known in her lifetime as well. She's got some very powerful friends, people like Ida Bay Wells, Mary Church Terrell, and she's also instrumental in the horticulture, gardening, and plant work 
at Tuskegee, especially as it pertains to women. And the way, well, one of the ways that we know she gets involved is that Booker T. Washington goes to England. He goes on a trip there and visit a place called Swanley Horticultural College. And at this college, this is a all women's horticultural college in Swanley, England. And what he sees there are women using horticultural gardening plant skills and applying it to their everyday academic curriculum. So what are they doing? They're doing shrub ID. They're doing landscape design. They're doing Florida floriculture work, the flower work. They're doing beautification work. And he decides, I want to have that at Tuskegee as well for the women here. And so the Washingtons form a plan. And what they end up having is the outdoor work for girls program. Now, this is a real picture of the women at Tuskegee doing, as the picture says, outdoor work. A few things to point out here. These women are wearing some fabulous, fabulous dresses, y'all. And Tuskegee, I said it was an industrial school. They made everything. These bricks that you see in the background, they made them. The window panes, they did that. They painted the buildings. They made the dresses they are wearing. They made the hats they're wearing. And they're also taking care of the grounds of Tuskegee University. Now, it wasn't just cool to be in horticulture at the time. This is a time that women aren't looked at as um, the, the type of people that you would see doing the outdoor landscape and beautification work. They're more so looked at as the dressmakers, as the basket makers, as people who would be inside of the home cooking. And so what Mrs. Washington does is that she comes up with a plan and she decides that I'm going to, I'm going to peek the scene here. I'm going to see who the most popular women are in this group. And when she identifies the most popular women in the group, she decides y'all are going to be the leader and you all, you women are going to be the ones that make it cool to be outside and doing this floriculture work, doing beautification, doing landscape design. And that is how they were able to make it um, more acceptable and palatable to the women at the time. And so these women are doing things like beekeeping. They're doing full on design. They're doing plant ID. That is with perennials, annuals, shrubs, trees. This is a full on horticultural curriculum. And I point these women out because even though this isn't a garden club, this is a class, look at these women because these women go on and go out into their communities. And at Tuskegee, one of the things students are charged with is that you bring this knowledge back home into your community. So these women go on to be mothers and grandmothers. And when we think about landscape knowledge that is passed down, think about women like this, whose names we ne may never know, but yet and still their horticultural contributions are very real and very valid in the United States of America. Now, another person, who needs no introduction. This is Dr. George Washington Carver, the greatest horticulturist of all time. And I love this picture of him because so often we just think of him as the peanut man or the man that was working with the cotton and this farmer from Missouri that went to school in Iowa. And this man is an outstanding artist, an artiste, y'all. This is his work for the World's Fair, one of the paintings that he did. So that's why I wanted to show it to you because this is a full on Renaissance man. Yes, he is a country boy, but he is out here um, understanding that horticulture is an art and a science. Now, when I talked about the, the people at Tuskegee, the women and the men there, the students um, that are learning horticulture amongst the many curriculums that you're, they're learning, engineering, architecture, you name it, they're learning it there. George Washington Carver creates many publications um, during his time. And one of those publications is the Negro Rural School and its relation to the community. And in this publication, it is a full on word for word playbook on how to build a school. I mean, with the measurements of the wood and George Washington Carver didn't necessarily write that part. Who actually did was Robert Taylor. Uh, you all, y'all in DC, I know y'all know Valerie Jarrett. That is her grandfather who is the first Black architect to graduate from MIT. So his information is in this book. George Washington Carver also spells out very clearly how to landscape ground. So this is early knowledge and proof of where Black Americans are sharing information and dispersing it 
on how to do beautification in the community. Now, it does say Negro Rural School in relation to the community. This document, I believe, is 1918, 1917s is the teens. And so you will hear me use the word Negro tonight in the historical context. Now, it is 2021. Don't run around y'all calling Black people Negroes. That's going to start a riot out there. But when you are using it in historical context and when you're researching this work, that is absolutely what you may see. So I just wanted to provide that so we were all clear on the same page this evening. Now in this book, this is one of the pages uh, from Dr. Carver's work or, or from the Department of Horticulture. So I mentioned David August Williston, the first black landscape architect, and it's a shame I didn't show his picture to y'all because he absolutely laid out parts of the Howard University campus and he absolutely set up shop there and worked until his 90s at his studio in Washington, DC. So shame on me, but um, I believe you could pull his picture up on Google. So he could have also contributed to this, uh, absolutely. And what I want to show you is this. This is where Dr. Carver is talking about beautification work. And here he's talking about hiding your fences with vine butter beams. Butter beams, y'all, are useful as well as ornamental. Now, what do we call that today? We call, if you are using butter beans or any type of uh, vine to decorate your fence as a food product, we call that edible landscaping. So look at here, George Washington Carver knowing what edible landscaping was before we even called it a thing. And this is also the type of beautification work that goes or comes out of these black communities and is dispersed uh, throughout the United States of America. So now we're going to get into the talk about the garden clubs and how this all comes about because I'm a big believer in using history as context. So it is the early uh, night or late 19 teens, early 1920s, World War I is popping off. The United States is over there with the Allied forces joined up with the UK and France fighting uh, Eastern Europe. So Austria, Germany, et cetera, et cetera. And war gardens are going into full effect. The troops need food. People are, are short. There are many men and women off to war. So yes, you're gonna have to grow your own food in America. We just don't have the time, the money, the accessibility. And also at this time, a lot of people, especially black people are starting to migrate from rural areas and into major cities. They're leaving their country towns and starting to be part of the great migration. They're leaving Georgia, heading to DC. They're leaving Alabama, heading to Chicago and so on and so on and so on. And so the war gardens are really where the garden club as a formal entity and as a popular thing in America start uh, gaining steam. And this has to do with the women and their organized, um, their, their organized movement specifically the women in the women's suffrage movement. And what we also wanna be very clear on is that black women were very active and very organized and very loud and proud during that movement. And they were also fighting the good fight, knowing that it wasn't just black women. Let me also be clear that it was other women of color fighting this fight, knowing that they very well may not get the right to vote. However, they know that it is the right thing to do and they jump in it and they, uh, they, they make noise. And I mentioned Mary Church Terrell, you'll see her picture later. And what's important here is because when you have the right to vote, that means you have power. And we're gonna see how that power from these women, these 2.5 million women, who all of a sudden have the right to vote when the 19th amendments passed in I believe 1920. So this is what happens next. These are some of the headlines, better American homes. War Gardens, World War I is wrapping up. Y'all, it's been a tiring time. It is a tiring time in America. The, the 1920s are starting to pop off. The Roaring Twenties, as they say, the Harlem Renaissance. And people are just kind of tired of growing food. And they say, you know what? We don't just want a war garden. We want better American homes because better homes lead to better gardens. Just like how you hear the magazine, better homes, better gardens. And these women, these 2.5 million women who now have exercised their power, they voted, they go to Washington and they say, we want a National Garden Week. And they get that. And President uh, William G. Harding is the president 
and he grants them this. And this is the start of this huge campaign to produce a real beautification movement in America. But what happens is that though the first National Gardening Week is in April of 1923, and the whole idea of it, let me be clear, the whole purpose was that America would be the garden capital of the world. So it starts in April of 1923, August of 1923, William Harding is dead, just dead. He's, he's gone. He, you know, gets sick, dies, and that's that. So Calvin Coolidge takes over the presidency. And when he does that, and I'm going to just, I, I realize my little camera is blocking my uh, special effect here. When he does that, these women say, hey, Calvin Coolidge, we want to keep this uh, garden thing going. We voted William G. Harding in. We can certainly vote you out. So I know you're going to be behind us, right? Of course, he's going to be behind them. And specifically this woman here that you see, she is from Kentucky. Her name is Marie Mattingly Maloney. This woman is an editor. She's a journalist. She owns papers. She marries well. So this is like pre-social media, right? She can get the name out there and get the word out there. And it was her idea specifically to start this National Garden Week, this Better Homes movement in America. So this is a little, um, I guess, I don't want to call it a plot twist, but I definitely want to call it an Easter egg because y'all are in DC. And for you all that have seen this picture, I don't feel like I can show it enough, but for you, you all that haven't, this is 1870 Washington, DC. This is Harper's Weekly. This is a real newspaper article. And I thank my uh, friend and colleague, a woman named Wamboy Ippolito for sharing this with me. And these are black women that came into downtown DC and set up shop in front of the Potomac River and brought their plants in on horse and carriage. And they didn't just bring in plants. You see cut flowers here. You see potted plants here. You see a community here. What you see is a mobile nursery. This is exactly what you see. And the reason I bring these up, these women up is because this is 1875, they are grown, but these women also go on to have children. And though we may never know their names and faces, thank God somebody had the foresight to capture and draw and illustrate them um, as they are. And 1870 is also five years after the Emancipation Proclamation. So these women are bringing their flowers that they've grown into downtown Washington, DC. So why is this important? Because in 1875, people like this woman that you see, Millie Paxton is born. And those women birthed other women. Now, I'm not saying any of those women are Millie Paxton's mama, but those women went on to have children that, of course, could garden, grow up to love plants, enjoy the landscape, understand beautification. Clearly, their mothers did. Now, Millie Paxton is a woman who is the founder of what is called the Ideal Garden Club in Virginia. And I thank a woman named uh, Meredith Baker Henney for sharing her story with me. I just found out about Mary, uh, Millie Paxton very recently, so I wanted to share her with you. Now, this is a woman who is incredibly active in the NAACP. She is incredibly active in women's voter registration for Black women. She gets oh, almost 700 Black women registered to vote. And she also organizes a garden club. And this is even before the garden clubs are officially federated. So this is all happening simultaneously during this whole women's rights, suffrages, better homes movement in America. And women are demanding, look, we want, we see blight around us, especially in our community. We demand beautification. We demand beauty and we demand extraordinary gardens like everybody else is going to get it. And they know that the United States of America is only going to do so much. And so they know that they are on, it, it's up to them. They have to make the world that they want to see. And that is exactly what they go on to create. So in the early 1930s, some interesting reports. So this is the word on the street is that a state organization is going to be launched. And it is not just a state organization. This is a state gardening organization and it is in the state of Virginia. And this is going to be very formal. It is going to be federated and it is going to be um, for us bias is going to be for black people. We're not included in the Garden Club of America during this time. And on this day in 
April 22nd, 1932, at Hampton, Virginia, four people gathered that day to form this club. The first person is a gentleman named Asa Sims, who is the head of floriculture there. He um, also works and manages the university greenhouses. He also goes out into the field and teaches. And you'll probably see him about four more times this presentation today. Incredibly important person. You're probably gonna think, you know, Abra might be a little obsessed with this man. And I am proud to say that I am. And I think by the end, you will be as well. Ethel Early Clark was at the table that day. She is our queen, y'all. She is the only woman at the table when this federated organization is formed and that organization is called the Negro Garden Club of Virginia. A man named P.J. Chesson, Purvis John Ch Purvis John Chesson, Purvis John Ch that is a, now that's a country name, Purvis. And I say that because my people are from the country. Purvis John Chesson, P.J. Chesson is there. Also a very significant person and educator in of the Hampton Roads area. And then finally, Dr. William Cooper, who is the head of extension at Hampton University. And so they come together and form the Negro Garden Club of Virginia officially with seven clubs um, who are the charter members. And I should also note that Asa Sims is the, what they call the uh, state advisor to the Better Homes movement. So he is the state advisor. He represents the, the black delegation to this Better Homes movement in America. Now, I mentioned Ethel Early Clark. She is the lady that you see in the middle highlighted in, in pink. And she is extraordinarily influential in this movement in her day. And she is the first president. So not just a founder, she is the first president of the Negro Garden Club of Virginia. And they have a few goals that they are setting uh, for their organization. And one, it, they want to stimulate interest in gardening, they want to pass information out into the public, and then they also want to encourage beautification um, in these Black communities. They're, they're essentially fighting blight. They, that, that is exactly what they're doing, and they do it in a very, very phenomenal way. And what I want to show you here is this is a picture of the third anniversary, this is the third anniversary of the Negro Garden Club of Virginia. The woman that you see in the middle, she's looking at us, she's got on, looks like a white jacket, who knows what color it is, doesn't matter. That is a woman named uh, Ruth B. McCoy. She is president of the Hunterville, Huntersville Better Garden Club of Norfolk, Virginia. Huntersville Better Garden Club of Norfolk, Virginia. And the man that you see standing up, you can't see his face. He's turned to the side and it looks like he has a something. And you, you can almost see she's reaching out. Her hand is out. That man is Asa Sims. And what she's reaching out to get is a silver vase that has been awarded to her garden club. And that silver vase represents that they are the winners that year. They have done the most work in their communities in terms of disseminating that information, in terms of spreading the word of beautification. And this trophy, this silver vase that is being awarded to Mrs. McCoy and her garden club, Ethel Early Clark, who you just saw on the slide before, the, the two slides before, she is the woman that is funding this trophy. So again, for us, by us, we're not going to wait on anybody. We're just going to make it happen. We are going to award ourselves. We're going to pat ourselves on, the black, our, on our own back. We are going to celebrate our own victories. And we're doing this hidden in plain sight. So when we talk about what mainstream America was doing or mainstream garden clubs, we have to ask who's mainstream because in their world, they were making it happen. They were happy, they were joyous, and they are doing all of this under the weight of Jim Crow in America. So they are really, really doing extraordinary things during extraordinary times. Now, Asa Sims, so you saw him passing out a trophy. Asa Sims cannot be separated from the legacy of these garden clubs who end up spreading all across America. And I wanna note that this is him sitting down at his desk. Now I told y'all that he was in charge of the greenhouse. He was in charge of floriculture at Hampton. He went out in the field to teach people about these gardening practices. And this is a man that also intended to be an artist, but his work study job at Hampton his assignment was to the greenhouse and that is how he gets into agriculture and floriculture and he realizes I don't have to paint my pictures I can plant my pictures with flowers and make these living creations and 
he believed in doing what we call an illustrated lecture. So how I'm giving y'all a PowerPoint tonight, that wasn't Ace of Sam's jam. He said, I'm going to give y'all 3D versions of what a landscape should look like. And that is what you see the arrow pointing to on his desk. He would have a version of what a landscape should look like and what a landscape shouldn't look like. And he used what he called his five point plan. Now, I also want to stick a pin right here. There is no, there are multiple right ways to do a landscape. So it, I, I don't want you all to ever let someone shame you or tell you your landscape is wrong. That is honestly a matter of opinion. Now, that don't mean you got to like it. It's a lot of landscape I don't like, but that doesn't make it wrong. That just means it's not for me. And so Ace of Sims is going out into the communities and not, this is just one group of people. This man is doing this all throughout the state of Virginia, all throughout the state of North Carolina, doing this around tens of thousands of people, Black people. And I want to state what is, to me, so valuable about his work, valuable about his work, is that oftentimes we forget about the rural communities, the country communities um, in America. And I say that now I'm born and raised in Atlanta, but we spent our weekends in Barnesville, Georgia, my mama's hometown. So I understand the rural country life and I know a black vernacular landscape when I see one. And this is a picture of a home in Bricks, North Carolina. And Asa Sims travels down there with a contingent for lack of better words. And they are going into this rural community um, to talk about beautification, to set up garden clubs, to excite the community. And I just wanted to show that because I've been showing a lot of Norfolk and Virginia and downtown DC. And let's all be clear that rural people have been doing this work as well and doing a mighty, mighty fine job of it. So these are some of the notes from the work that was done. Now that rural community, I didn't mention this, that community or this community that we're talking about right now is a brick North Carolina, Brick, North Carolina. And what they talk about in their notes, in their documentation, in their formal um, booklet, is that the Garden Club is one of the most thriving organizations in Brick. And this tickles me because I told you my people from Barnesville, it's a handful of people living in Barnesville. So to say it's a thriving organization in Brick, I don't know what was popping off in Brick, but the Garden Club was probably the hottest thing in town, probably next to the church. The preacher man, whoever was the best preacher was probably number one, and the Garden Club was a close second. So for them to call it a thriving organization meant that people were very, very much engaged. And let me show you how engaged they were, these rural Black people in Brick, North Carolina. Now, look at this writing. Now, people will say, Oh, this sounds like the writing of David Thoreau, but this is the country people of North Carolina and I get my full life reading it because they're talking about the birds they want to identify, the flowers and trees in the woodland, and they the gardens that they like best and, and the plants that they want most in their own garden. So they are beautifully writing and documenting their journey in this garden club, and it is amazing. How amazing is it, Abra? Well, let me show you how amazing it is. I, wanted, I told you I know a black uh, vernacular landscape when I see one. And specifically, if you look over here in the corner, there is a woman sitting there. And let's, let's show you the close up of how lively and thriving their gardens were. Now, in landscape terminology, we would call this a rockery. That is what you see when you see the rocks stacked up and plants tucked in quaintly, if you read the garden books, that's how they like to say it. And this is exactly the type of stunning landscapes that Black people in rural America are making. Thank God somebody took a picture above this woman's head. There, it looks like she took uh, maybe something like a palette, but this is a trellis, y'all. This is a well thought out design. And look at how proud she's sitting there, hat in her lap. She know, look, she might, when they talk about thriving in brick, she might have a baddest garden in that town. And I probably wouldn't argue with this, this is exceptional work. And this is the type of work coming out of these garden clubs, a type of work that people have the right to be very proud of. And sadly, the type of work that you don't see as much of today because we have all these HOA rules that tell us what we have to plant, when we have to plant it, what day we cut our grass. And so what we lose is some of the creativity. And another note I want to point out is that just like George Washington Carver was 
growing butter beans along a fence, edible landscaping, that's what we call in 2021. What do we call what this woman did today? We call it shabby chic. We call it repurposing. We call it bric-a-bac. We call it upcycling. So what I'm getting at is that we aren't new to this. We are very true to this type of landscaping using what you have at hand to create beautiful um, vignettes around you. Now, moving on back to these Virginia Garden Clubs. So we, we've left Virginia, gone to North Carolina, gone down to Brick, coming back up to Virginia. These women are so organized. And there are also some men and junior clubs. I, I didn't state that earlier, but I, I do want to be clear on that. But the women are overwhelmingly the organizers, the focus, um, the energy that's in the room. They are, they're, they're collecting dues, they're making money and, uh, or I, I don't want to say making money, they're not profiting off this, but they're, they're able to um, purchase an ad in the newspaper, which isn't necessarily cheap. And these are the garden clubs. You see them collectively, all these awesome names, American Beauty Garden Club, Ideal Garden Club, Hall Street Garden Club, and they're congratulating the Norfolk Journal and Guide on their anniversary. So that's how powerful and how much reach they had. And specifically this Linwood Beautification Group, I point this one out because Mrs. Flores Chesson is the founder and president. Now I showed y'all Purvis John Chesson and that is her husband. So let me show you a picture of the Linwood Beautification Group. And this is a picture of them um, Back in the day, I don't know which person is Florence Chesson or even if she's in this picture, but you can see this is a picture. I want to say this picture is from 19, it's the late 1920s or early 1930s. It's one or the other, but this is how long the Linwood Beautification Group has been around. The gentleman that you see here, again, is Asa Sims. Now, what's going on, we've left 1932. Now we're in 1942. And it is the 10th anniversary of these Negro Garden Clubs of Virginia. Now, by this time, there's no longer seven clubs. There's at least 70 and probably hundreds more. They're just not documented. And that's just in Virginia. We're not talking about Ohio that had their own federation. We're not talking about North Carolina that had their own or Georgia or the Midwestern states or Louisiana. We're just talking about Virginia. So we're seeing the progression of Asa Sims. And he is the state advisor to these garden clubs. So he is the one that is shaking the tambourine out there with these women and highlighting the work that they do. And on the 10th anniversary, the torch has been passed. Ethel Early Clark is no longer the president of these garden clubs, but a woman named Lillian Hughes Savage is the president of these garden clubs. And she makes an address um, to the group and talks about the work that they have done. And this address is given at Hampton University because this is where the 10th anniversary celebration is and rightly because this is where it all started, it all went down. And what does she talk about during her address, Mrs. Lillian Hughes Savage? She talks about you know, pledging uh, to do this much needed work in the community. And she talks about the work is in our hands. The title of this presentation Essentially, it's on us, y'all. The work is on us. If we're going to get this done, all we all we got. That's exactly what the work is in our hands means. We all we got, okay? And I don't want this to be lost on anybody. So part of her address, she talks about um, that we must carry on and complete the job. We must overbalance ugliness with beauty. We must overbalance ugliness with beauty. Now, yes, is she talking about the landscape? Yes. And I'm certain she's talking about the ugliness of war. And this is a black woman in 1942, Virginia, in 1942, America. Let's just keep it real. Let's read between the lines here. She's also overbalancing, not just her, millions of black people are overbalancing the ugliness of the Jim Crow era and not just letting the weight of that crush their soul, they're able to find joy. That's the biggest, most, I would say, incredible thing about Black life, the resilience, the joy, the happiness they are still able to find and continue to find when the world gets heavy. So when things like this are said, we, we, we got to keep our antenna up and understand 
the context of the time. And that's why it's important to not just say, oh, garden clubs and raw rum, see what was going on in 1942 and why someone would talk about ugliness at the time. And Mrs. Huge Savage isn't here to let us know anymore, but the, the clues are there, the breadcrumbs are there to let us know. So for that 10th anniversary, it's a big deal as it should be. And Asa Sims is a state advisor and the gentleman that you see here is a gentleman named H. Hamilton Williams. Now, Asa Sims, Ethel Early Clark, H. Hamilton Williams, we could talk about them for days on end, but we're gonna fit all this into the next uh, 15 minutes, okay? So Asa Sims is the editor of what is handed out later that year, or maybe even in 1943 when it's completed, it's handed out, is called the Handbook of the Negro Garden Club of Virginia. Now, H. Hamilton Williams, just like Asa Sims, Ethel Early Clark, I'm saying it's like these are just normal people. These are extraordinary people. This man's mother owned her own florist in Roanoke, Virginia. So he is a legacy of horticulture. He goes to Hampton, graduates in horticulture, goes down to teach at North Carolina A&T, another HBCU, historically black college and university, comes back to Hampton and goes to Cornell and finishes his PhD in horticulture. He is also the first person, black, white, anybody, um, to document and uh, write a thesis, write a book on Black landscapes in America. Now, he is critical of these landscapes. However, his observations are acute. And that I'm not saying that he's critical to throw him under the bus. My respect and admiration for H. Hamilton Williams is high. This is a man that's educated at Cornell now. So he's learning landscapes through a very European canon. And just because you're black doesn't mean you have to like black vernacular landscapes. I happen to like them. They're black people that love bonsai. That's their thing. And they're not Japanese. So you like what you like. That's what I'm getting at. But H. Hamilton Williams is the editor of this handbook. And in this handbook, he brings together garden experts from all across America. People like David Burpee from Burpee Seeds is giving who's his two cents in this book. The uh, director of the Morris Arboretum up there in Pennsylvania is giving his two cents in this book. So are other academics from Hampton and other places across the United States, including Cornell. And it makes you wonder, how did H. Hamilton Williams even know all these people in the first place? We don't know. And this is what happens when our history is lost or erased or swept under the rug. And what we do know is that the foreword, the intro letter to this book is written by Eleanor Roosevelt. How did he know the first lady of the United States? Well, we don't know, but what we do know is that Eleanor Roosevelt was a very good friends with Mary McLeod Bethune. She had a position in Washington. So my hypothesis, I cannot prove it. I have not proven it. I'm determined to make it my life's work to figure out how these people knew each other and how Eleanor Roosevelt wrote the foreword to this handbook. Um, and this is a handbook that these women are using at their garden clubs meetings. They are using it to study and understand landscapes. They are using it to grow plants, propagate plants. They are using it to lay out designs. They are using it to install trees. They are using it for interior scape, house plants, um, if you will. So this is a big deal because this is essentially saying Michelle Obama wrote the foreword to my garden book. Like that's casual things. That's, that's a very big deal. So that's why I want y'all to understand the power and reach of these garden clubs of H. Hamilton Williams, of Asa Sims, and of Ethel Early Clark. They are the dream team. So in the book, they talk about some of their accomplishments. Now, I'm not going to read all of this to you. I'm only bringing it up because this goes beyond cutesy, pretty stuff in the landscape. And if you look in the top left-hand corner, you see one of the things that I've pulled out when they list what they've done in 10 years is that citizens have become civic conscious and have become voters. So I'm not just out here fighting blight. I'm out here saying, y'all gonna fix my roads. I want my mail on time. And we're voting now, we're organized, we meet weekly. And if we meet weekly, they're meeting weekly, we are voting blocks. We can vote you in, we can vote you out. So understand the power that these people have. They, their plants were their power. These garden clubs aren't just cucumber sandwiches and Folgers coffee, y'all. This is real deal work that they're doing. And they're using, uh, another one I wanna point out, the one in the middle, it says, 
we're not only using native shrubs, we're using native resources, both human and material. We saw some of that down in Brick, North Carolina. So to, to understand what they're doing and what they're doing it with and how they're using it and how they're supporting each other, and most importantly, how organized and how influential that they are. Now that's my alarm telling me I got 10 more minutes. So we are gonna roll through the rest of this. And I want to point out here that I talked about Asa Sims and his um, work, and just give me one second, y'all just wanna make sure that this is cut off. I do apologize. Okay, so Asa Sims um, is extraordinary as he is, he also owns a florist and he owns a two acre state and he hosts events for these garden clubs at his two acre state. This picture is grainy. Nevertheless, you can see in the background, the little square says Sims Flores. And this is just one of the advertisement sections from the Negro Garden Club handbook. So you see the Ace of Sims is in there, the Kellogg Company. Yes, those are the, the, the cereal people. How they knew these women, we don't know either. I don't know anyway. Barnhaven Gardens, that is the uh, famous, if you're into primroses, Florence uh, Bellis or Florence Levy Bellis, if you call her that. Um, the Barnhaven primroses, which are world famous at this point, no longer in Oregon, they're over in France, but nevertheless, that's who that is. So Asa Sims is here with his children. And this is a picture of them in his workshop. Now, this isn't just a florist shop. These are greenhouses. You can see those vents in the background. If you look at that picture, one of his daughters goes into the uh, floral business. His um, son or son-in-law goes up to Philadelphia, studies at one of the floral schools there. And uh, he just has an extraordinary life that is connected to horticulture, floriculture, and beautification his whole entire career. And it is a family, family business. I want to also talk here quickly about the Emancipation Oak. There may be very well be some Hampton grads on here today. So we can't talk about um, all this work, all of Hampton and how important the Emancipation Oak is. This is Mary Peake. This is um, the black woman who taught the first classes on what under what came to be known the Emancipation Oak, which still exists at Hampton University today. And this is the oak where the first Southern reading of the Emancipation Proclamation happens. And the reason I'm showing you all this is because the woman that you see on the left in this picture of three, that is Irma Thompson. She is the president of the Ever Blooming Garden Club. And in 1935, her club, uh, this is also Elizabeth Hines is with her, these two women are educators. They took seeds from the Emancipation Oak, propagated them and named them after a man named N.B. Clark. N.B. Clark, who was a pioneer black educator in Virginia, also a classmate of Booker T. Washington. And they plant these seedlings, they grow them into trees, and then they plant this tree at the Booker T. Washington Elementary School in the Hampton Roads area, I cannot remember exactly which city. I want to say it's Norfolk, but I can look it up later if y'all need me to. And now this picture ain't the 1930s. Look at this fashion. This is the 1960s. The glasses give it away. Uh, and so does the pill box hat, the derby there. But again, they propagated this plant in the 1930s, propagated it by seed. So these aren't casual things they're doing with their garden. They're recognizing the importance of the emancipation oak. They're recognizing we need to keep this lineage going. And as far as we know, the tree is still there today. So in the 1990s, a woman named Lillian Lovett, uh, who attended that school as a child, felt really drawn to this tree. She never understood why. So she starts doing her research and she realizes, oh my gosh, what I found in this file cabinet is that this tree is the Clark Oak. It is the lineage of the Emancipation Oak. And that is why I'm feeling some kind of way. So when people try to tell you, oh, plants don't have power, that's woo woo, tell them to back off. If it gives you energy, if it gives you power, if it's something about it you can't shape, then it's something about it you can't shape. So this is extraordinary that these women had the foresight to do this. And other people have indeed propagated the Emancipation Oak sin since, but I wanted to show you who did it first. And this is a picture from actually the 1980s, going back a little, where the Ever Blooming Garden Club, which was still in existence at that time, I do not know, that they're still in existence, was doing beautification work with the children in and around the school and the community. Now, I wanna to talk to you about, we're gonna leave Virginia and we're gonna quickly in the next five minutes, go around the country and show you some of these clubs. So this is a picture of what is called 
the Our Garden Club of Philadelphia and vicinity, the OGCPV. The woman that you see in the middle holding the garden book is a woman named Marion Wright Hines. She founds this garden club in 1939. And to this day, they are the oldest consecutive meeting black garden club in the United States. They still meet today in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And they have an extraordinary legacy. Now, this is a picture of a flower event, uh, a community event of the Community Garden Club in Portsmouth, Virginia. And in 1963, Lillian Jones was the president of that club, of the Community Garden Club in Portsmouth, Virginia. And I talked about the OGCPV, the Our Garden Club of Philadelphia and Vicinity. This woman here is a woman named Judge Lillian Ransom, Judge Lillian Ransom. She is the past president of the OGCPV. She is a board member of the PHS, the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society, and she is a judge, I mean, like a real Pennsylvania state judge, not just some flower show judge, but her grandmother was the president of one of these Negro Garden Clubs in Virginia, and here she is, 2021, part of this extraordinary legacy, the OGCPV in Philadelphia, and president of a garden club herself. So I just wanted to show you how this lineage goes out and is dispersed and uh, just, you know, just pops off all across America. So I'm gonna just drop these animations because I know I am creeping up on time, but I'm gonna explain everybody that you see in the picture while I talk. This woman that you see is named Edwina Cruz. She is the president of the Howard High School in Wilmington, Delaware. She is a friend of Booker T. Washington, and she's also a controversial figure like him. So she does have that, um, yeah, we can pull ourselves up from the bootstrap mentality. This is a black woman, um, but we know that that's just, it's more easier said than done. It's just not that simple all the time. Now she is a woman, her mom was from Puerto Rico, her daddy's from Germany. That's why you see this white passing look that she has, and she identifies as black. And she has famous friends, including Frederick Douglass, including, Mary Church Terrell, including W.B. Du Bois, and including Booker T. Washington. And she brings these famous friends to her school, the Howard High School, same Howard uh, name as Howard University in D.C., and ask them to speak to the students. And in the graduating class of the early 1900s is a young man that you see here named Ralph Elwood Brock. And at his high school graduation, Booker T. Washington is speaking again, a friend of Edwina Cruz, Howard, I mean, I'm sorry, Ralph Elwood Brock goes on to become the first black forester in the United States, graduates from Penn State, Mount Alto, um, and credits Edwina Cruz, his, his high school principal with, the with his love of nature. So what does she have to really do with garden clubs? This woman that you see here on the left, this is a woman named Etta Woodland. She was a, uh, in the care of Mrs. Cruz. She's originally from Trinidad. Mrs. Cruz brings her to the Howard High School. Etta Woodland goes on to Oberlin College, plays all kinds of instruments, is an extraordinary music teacher, and forms the George Washington Carver Garden Club at the Walnut Street Christian Association in Wilmington, Delaware. So these garden club people, they're not just going to plant something and then they just go home and chill, paint their nails. They're out here doing extraordinary things like playing many instruments, influencing their communities. This garden club hosted shows. They had fall events. They had uh, uh, flower events. So very big deals of what these women are doing. Also, in Iowa, now we're not really thinking about Iowa and garden clubs in the 1930s and 40s, but they were there. This woman is named Lillian Edmonds, and there's a lot of Lillians I mentioned today. Lillian Edmonds wanted to be a pharmacist and a nurse. She couldn't find, she majored in that. She can't find work in Des Moines, Iowa. And so she goes to work at the Wilkie House. This is a place where education is given to Black people. It is community. It is uh, upliftment. And this is the place that she starts a garden club for her community. Now, I told you these Black women in these garden clubs, they're not just anybody's. Edmonds, this is Edmonds Elementary School in Des Moines, Iowa, and this woman is in the Iowa State Hall of Fame. So you can be a member of a garden club, you can be a master gardener, and you might end up in a hall of fame, and not necessarily for your garden work, but this is how important that type of work was to them and for their community and the people around them. 
And I want to show you uh, two more garden clubs. This is the Oz this is Ozark, Alabama on the left the Daffodil Garden Club with 27 members. This is Macomb, Mississippi Garden Club on the right. And in that garden club, this is a picture from the winners of their annual flower show, who you see standing up on the far right, kind of with her hands in the pocket, is a woman named Eula Fortenberry. She won the Tricolor Award and she won a blue ribbon. That's my also my alarm, y'all. I'm so sorry. I have that going off. I just want to make sure I'm respectful of your time. We'll still have at least five minutes for questions. But Eula Mae Fortenberry wins um, all these awards in Macomb, Mississippi for her work in garden clubs. And Macomb, Mississippi is a place where there's a, a famous Black tree farmer from down there as well. So don't sleep on these little rural towns and what their contributions are to the horticulture and landscape and garden clubs. Now I'm gonna take y'all down to Texas. I told you I wanted to give you a little garden club tour. This is Opal Washington, and she is the county extension agent for Travis County, which is Austin, Texas. Now, Opal Washington is known more for her recipes and her work in the home economic side of extension, but I'm a former extension agent. I know how it goes down. If somebody calls your house, uh, your, not your house, sorry. <laughs> I hope the people aren't calling my house, but if someone calls your extension office asking about canning, you answer the question. Asking about snakes, you answer the question. If they're asking about plants, you answer the question. And the picture that you see on the right is the first black garden club in Austin, Texas. Alice T. King is the woman on the far right. This woman owns a funeral home in Austin. So that means she has wealth, influence, reach. That means she has landscapers. Of course you keep a nice garden, you own a funeral home. And this is also a woman who was married to a gentleman named Mordecai Johnson at one time, who was the first black president of Howard. So I show Opal Washington because though we may not be able to prove in some scientific document, she taught plants to these women. Of course she did. She was the black extension agent for Travis County at the time their garden club was formed. So there is a relationship here. And I wanna show y'all Milwaukee. This is Mrs. Artie Hallier. This is some work that she did with her town and country garden club. And this floral work that she did is to represent and highlight black achievement. And you can see that she loved baseball. You see Willie Mays down there, probably Jackie Robinson as well. And she loved that, that their group, they were self-taught women. They figured out how to put on their own plant shows and floral shows and do their own designs. And they were so exceptional at their work these two women that you see here in the green picture, Artie Halyard is there still wearing her hat. And then Mrs. William Robinson is the one sitting there holding her pocketbook. <laughs> That's something that, that I just, it just warms my heart to see that. But let me tell you what's the real deal here. These are 11 ribbons from the Wisconsin State Fair that Mrs. Wilbur Robinson won. So in that year, I can't remember if it's 49 or 51. I think it's 51. Nobody won more state ribbons than her at the Wisconsin State Fair. That's a very big deal that you win all these horticultural plant garden women, uh, ribbons and you're a member of the Town and Country Garden Club. And this picture on the right is just one of the visitors at their flower shows. Look at how intense this visitor is observing this plant arrangement. These women were not playing games in Milwaukee, y'all. This was some serious business in these garden clubs. And we are gonna move on. We are almost at the end. So I'm gonna definitely get us out of here by 6.55. We'll have some questions. Asa Sims, it's the late 1960s. How do we know? Well, we know because it is flip. That's how we know. And he is with a member of a junior garden club. And this is a young woman who won for her plant arrangement. So you saw him in the game from pretty much 1930. He arrives in Hampton in like the 1920s to the 1960s. He passed away in the 1970s. He has dedicated his life to garden clubs, beautification, and making America a beautiful, beautiful place and doing it, not looking for any uh, accolades, but we deserve to give him all the accolades. He is certainly a hero of mine. And I bring this up because April 22nd, 2022, yes, that's Earth Day, and yes, it's a Friday, but most importantly, it is the 90th anniversary of when the Negro Garden Club of Virginia was formed on April 22nd, 1932. The woman you see in the back, this is from the 1980s. This is Queen Jackson. Her name is really Queen and she's wearing her crown because she's been crowned the, um, the uh, queen of the state 
Garden Club of Virginia, and that is what they're calling themselves into the 1980s. <clears throat> this is my last slide. And I show this because the Pine Center Garden Club is a black garden club in Atlanta, Georgia. And they're the garden club that gave me my first opportunity to give a keynote address. And I love this historic speak, uh, picture shows their guest speaker at the garden club. And I super love this lady that's sitting there not believing a word that's coming out of this woman's mouth. But some of y'all may not believe me, but all of this is true. I thank you so much for being with me today, spending your Tuesday evening with me today on Zoom. What a privilege, what a joy. DC Master Gardeners, if you have any questions, you are welcome to reach out to me and my email address is there. And specifically, I wanna thank uh, Patricia Bond. Thank you for all the logistics helping me. And most importantly, thank our other queen, Dr. Rodney, Marcella, Burton. You are amazing. I appreciate you having me and forgive me for going over five minutes, but we do have five minutes for questions. Thank y'all so much. And I will uh, drop my, I'll stop this year. Oh my goodness, Abra, I am blown away. I feel like this talk could have been like six hours long and still we'd only be scratching the surface. Thank you so much. This was amazing. I'm sure everybody felt the same because the comments in the chat box were going like crazy and all compliments to you. Um, if anybody has questions, type them in the chat box. Um, let's start with one that came up a couple of times. Uh, what is black vernacular landscape? So, so a black vernacular landscape um, is when you see things like the, uh, you may see a toilet, an old toilet that is installed in a landscape, plants have been planted in it. You may see these tires that are painted. You may see those rock stones that are painted white. And what we know is that uh, white was one of those colors that um, allowed um, connection to the spirit world, right? Um, and we're thinking about how black people thought of their landscapes before colonizations. So essentially before um, Christianity is, is, is brought forth to them. And little things, you may see broken dishes in those landscapes. So when I, by the time I saw it as a child down in Barnesville, it was just what my aunties, my great aunts were doing. Now their mama's mama may have been adding those broken dishes to the landscape because those were what were called experienced objects. Those were objects that someone that they had uh, loved that has passed on and gone to heaven, that was an object they used and having that broken object there, something that they had experienced, kept them close to home in the landscape. So I hope that kind of explains it. If not, I'll come back and give y'all a whole lecture on black vernacular gardens because they are amazing. Oh my goodness, I think that would be wonderful. Um, here's a question from Carol. How do these people know each other? Most of them black and white were connected to people who were active in civil rights support, HBCU supports, et cetera. How do these people know each other? Um, I, this is what I think. And, and I'm not just saying this because I think it, I'm saying this because you can see it over and over to, um, when you're doing this research. Communities were real back then. The church was a real center. Black neighborhoods were not and, and I'll, I, I live in Atlanta. Black neighborhoods here are still ex extensive, even with gentrification. But what I'm saying is that though I grew up in a Black neighborhood, I live in a uh, mixed neighborhood. Now, it's not mostly white. It's not mostly Black. It's, it's just some of everybody. And so I'm saying that to say is that I think in many ways, it was much easier to know each other because the doctors in your community, the um, the the the, the voodoo lady is in your community, right? The, the teacher is your community. They're your neighbors. They're living across the street. And so it's so much easier to pass information along. But when 1968 comes around and the Civil Rights Act is passed and Black people can now pretty much live in any neighborhood they want, we leave our communities and what we, I, I clearly was not the intention, but uh, something that happens that I think that we all in some ways regret is that that link is broken. That strong community link is broken. Those businesses are destroyed. And it's not just because they moved out. There's a whole slew of things that the American government has done as well. But that is how they know each other. I know that was a long way to say that, but they were living together. They were dependent on each other. They needed each other and they made do when nobody else was gonna be there for them. Amazing. Okay. Uh, how can we get a copy of the Virginia Book Club book? You, I, 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 
I think it's on Google. I'm, I'm pretty sure it is. However, I'm happy to send it to you, Patricia. I'll email you. Matter of fact, let me make a note to email you when this presentation is over and Patricia can send it to y'all. How about that? Perfect. Um, do you have any research on the role that enslaved African-Americans played in cultivation of fruit trees and vines? I do not have any research. Well, I have a little bit. Like I know of um, a black man that cultivated um, this uh, mango that is the only mango that pretty much produces in November. I do know about the black man. I cannot remember his name uh, down in Louisiana that created a um, or cultivated a pecan with a thicker whole shell. And the reason their names aren't top of mind is because my horticulture background in discipline is in ornamental horticulture. So flowers, trees, shrubs, that's what I studied at Auburn, which is right down the road from Tuskegee. And so the pro productive side, the fruit and vegetable is always second to my research. However, I came from an ag family. My The farm I went to in Barnesville, that was a farm with the chickens and the cows running around. So it is becoming uh, more necessary to me because y'all care about food. Y'all don't care about these trees and flowers the way I was caring about them. So. Um, I could definitely share some more information with you about that, but I own that's not my strongest suit. Yes, we do. We care about flowers. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not saying that y'all don't. I just look when Michelle Obama launched that White House garden. My, I was an arborist in the city of Atlanta, and it just I just saw gardens come up everywhere, food gardens, and it's amazing. So I just know that food is way cooler than like looking at shrub ID. Of course it is, but it's equally important to know both. Absolutely, okay. Um, it's seven o'clock now, so I think we have to wrap up. Oh, but I should mention, Abra, will you tell us a little bit about the book you have coming out soon? I'm sure you'll yes. have a lot of a lot of interested clients. Oh, okay. okay. The book is called um, Conquer the Soil. You can just type in Conquer the Soil on Google, and it talks about Black America and untold stories of our uh growers, gardeners, and uh, farmers, I believe. And it will be out in the winter of 2023. Um, and I hope y'all buy it. So I say that, and I know that's a shameless plug, but I really do <laughs> because these stories are important. So who will you see in there? You'll see Asel Sims. You'll see H. Hamilton Williams. You will see the mango grower. You will see entomological artists. You will see these black women from DC, these flower sellers, these mobile nursery women. You will see um, black women like Annie Mae Van Reed from Darlington, South Carolina that owned a five acre nursery and greenhouse. So you're gonna see some extraordinary work uh, from black people in America, mostly prior to 1968, Roland Jefferson up there, DC, the gentleman that saved those cherry trees uh, in DC. You'll see him in the book as well. And um, everybody's life is incredibly extraordinary. And I think that you will just really, really love it and, and feel like these people are your friends. Wonderful. Okay. Well, thank you everybody so much. Dr. Rodney, I see you have your hand up. Do you want to would you like to speak or? I'm not sure. Okay, um, I'm going to stop recording. Abra, thank you so much for coming. Um, I will follow up with you by email. Thank you everybody for tonight. I did record the session and I'll send everybody the recording because I'm sure you'll want to watch it again like I do. Um, have a great night, everybody. Thanks so much. This is awesome. Abra thank and you. Spencer and Spencer Lynchburg, Virginia. Check it out. Yes, yes, Please. of course. Yes, thank she. You. I will go to the garden, of course. She's extraordinary. You would love it. You would love it. All the best. Thank all you. the best to you. All the best to you. Thank, Thank you so you, much. Bro. Thank that you. That was phenomenal. Thank you. That was this amazing. Is Dr. <laughs> oh, yes. Thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, there's Ra Amin. <laughs> hey, Ra. How you doing? <laughs>